to welcome you to the Hungry Heart Service in Jackson, Tennessee. Hungry Hearts Ministries is a Torah observant, spirit filled ministry, and we uh, use certain worship, Hebrew worship tools, like to lead. We believe that Yeshua Messiah died for our sins and for the sins of all mankind, and because of that, we believe we need to follow his commandments and his rules and live the way he taught us. We're filled with God's spirit and we worship him with it. Today's message is capitalism versus communism. And I want to uh, offer you today our book, Careful Stewardship of God's Rich Blessing, which will give you far more information on how to take care of the things you have and handle the money you've earned. And also, freedom under the law of God. I want you to understand there is no freedom without the law of God. It's very important. Most Americans should know this but are not taught anymore that all freedom comes under law. You're ruled by a tyrant or you're ruled by the law. So I know they don't teach it anymore. I also want to make available to you our free ministry magazine, Pursuit. It comes out quarterly. You can email me at HungryHeartsMinistry.com uh, uh, and you can email me from there and I will send you this magazine without cost. I like it. It's got to know that you want it. You know, I want to talk today to our younger people because they're not taught in America. They're not taught. We were all taught. Those of us with all the gray hairs, the older heads, we were all taught the greatness of our country, the power of our country, the might of our country, that we are a great nation, that we earn this greatness by being good people, doing good things in the world, and that we have a superior system, and that's why we're blessed and have. But our young people right now are being taught that we're not a great nation. We're no better than the other nations. As a matter of fact, in many times, our young people are being taught. Look, I'm talking under 40, guys. I'm not talking teens. I'm talking under 40. They're taught that our nation is not exceptional, that the sins of our nation are worse than the sins of the other nations, and that we do not deserve what we have. They've been lied to and deceived. So if you're under 40, I'm, I'm here to tell you today and explain to you that you have been lied to and you have been deceived about this great country that you live in. And I'm going to show you today from the Bible why our country is great and how you can be a great part of this great country. We've been told, the younger generations have, that our fabulous excess is why the rest of the world is in poverty. As a matter of fact, the former president, Barack Obama, wrote a book, The Dream of My Fathers, and he said in that book, and this was widely played all over the news, he did the audio book, so they had him say it, amen? He did the audio book, he did his own audio book, you don't have to do your own audio book, but he did his, and he, he quoted, he even gave this quote, white man's greed runs a world in need. That's not true. That's not even close to truth. That's not even close to truth. And they point to places around the world where they have large amounts of raw materials. And these countries earn their living by selling these raw materials to countries who take the raw materials and manufacture things. How many of you realize that Japan, a great nation, has no natural resources on their island? They have nothing but people. They have to buy everything that they use. So every Japanese car, all the steel, all the coal to make the steel, all the, all the oil to make the plastic, everything had to be bought from somebody else, brought to the island, manufactured into cars, and then they sell the cars to earn their living. Well, there are countries in the world that they sell their raw materials. That's how they earn their living. Come on. It's free market. How many of you realize a great country like Australia? derives its primary source of revenue from selling raw materials. So it's not just third world countries that sell their raw materials. How many of you realize that right now, because we're not burning a lot of coal, we're selling a lot of coal? Mm -hmm. Everybody sells something to earn a living. Mm -hmm. So our purchasing their raw materials is not running them in need. Our purchasing their raw materials is making them wealthy and mm -hmm. giving them the money they need Amen. to buy the food they can't grow. Come on, somebody. Amen. This is a, a free world trading system. The reason that so many of you younger people believe these lies is because your school teachers told them to. It's taught in schools. Mm -hmm. My generation may have been the last one to be taught about America's greatness, why we're great, what makes America great, why we are the profound foremost nation of the world that we are. And this effort to deceive America's school children goes back to a man by the name of John Dewey in the 1930s. John Dewey is a very noted educator, so if you get into the educational circles, they regard this guy as the father of modern education. 
The problem is the father of modern education was a communist, and a lot of the educators that have followed him are communists who want to make communists out of your children. Y'all get this in a minute because we're going someplace. He had the foresight to understand that as long as the truth about America, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and our economic capitalist system was taught, nobody would follow communism. Nobody's going to follow that mess. Why would you follow that mess when you're a free people and you get to determine your own course of action? You get to determine what, what vocation you're going to have. You get to determine the house you're going to buy. Why, why, why would you set up for a communist system that's going to hand you the crumbs? You have to be taught that the communist system is better than the capitalist system. But can anybody name one? Well, they can't. So then they, they, they go to this specious argument and they say, well, it's just not run right if better people did it. Well, okay, we've got we've got a hundred years of better people trying to run communist systems, and not one has ever worked anywhere at any time in any place. Every you know it's bad when the president of Russia is lecturing America on don't go to communism. We just came out of it; it doesn't work. That's bad, right? That happened in the last administration. So we need to understand that God has given us the economic tools to be a great nation, and we as industrious people took the tools and went to work. Praise God, we ought to be the apostles of this around the world because we're not the only industrious people in the world. There's plenty of industrious people in other countries, and if they were given half the chance of freedom we have, they might even be greater than us. Amen? But the problem with most third world countries is that during the 1960s, they adopted communism as their economic model. And so they are still poor to this day. 40, 50, 60 years after they were freed from colonialism, they're still poor because they're under communist rule and communist economic systems that cannot provide for their people. It's not their fault. It's their leader's fault. We, however, still have a capitalist system. We should not fault it. We should embrace it. Amen? The political progressives come from a movement in the late 1800s that wanted to convert everybody to communism. A lot of y'all don't realize this, but Karl Marx was a progressive in Germany in the late 1870s who came up with this whole idea of communism. And if you lived under the, the uh, imperial German government, that might have seemed like a better model to you than the one that they had. But in my 1870s America, this was not the imperial uh, government of Germany where their economy was based on who was the most loyal to the Kaiser. Our system was based on who can provide the best goods and services to the customer. See, some of y'all didn't get taught economics very well. I can see that y'all are looking at me like I'm teaching you something brand new. These progressives, the reason they're called progressives is because they want to, quote, progress, unquote, from our constitutional system of government to a top-down command and control economy so that they, quote, can control the masses, unquote. These people, these progressives, who have, have been a political movement since the 1880s in the United States of America, they, they know better how to run your life than you do, and they want to tell you what you can eat, when you, when you can eat it, what you've got to buy, where you can live, who gets credit, who doesn't get credit, who can have cars, and now they've decided nobody can have cars. And so they're trying to completely remodel your life the way they want you to be because they think they're that much smarter than you. The genius of the Founding Fathers was... Turn the people loose and let them follow their own course. And maybe there are knuckleheads here or there. Maybe there are bad actors here or there. But over the course of time, an educated free people will seek out and follow the right course. This worked famously until the progressives began to really gain power in the 1930s. Many people do not realize that the agenda of Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a communist agenda. Many people do not realize that when he won election in 1932, his vice presidential candidate was the Communist Party candidate. And so he imposed a top-down command and control economy on America to, quote, get us out of the Great Depression, which just made it last from 1929 until World War II broke out. Now, it, did, it was slightly useful, they tell you, in World War II to produce the war material to beat the Axis powers. But then you dig a little deeper and you find out it was the executive of General Motors who corralled the nation's industrialists and the CEOs of the other major corporations 
to pull together and make the war effort. It wasn't the government bureaucrats that made it happen. They were in F in every way. It was the private sector that came, pulled together. Oh, y'all get this after a while. So the progressives want to take away your freedom. They want to take away your economy. They want to take away your constitution. And they're about to give away your national sovereignty. Young people, wake up before it's too late. You know, we're all getting old now. The country's passing into your hands. The millennials will decide whether this country remains free or goes communist because our generation is passing the torch to you whether we like it or not. And you guys have got to wake up because you're on the precipice of plunging this country into Venezuela-style poverty and turmoil. The U.S. economy is based on Torah. I'm a Torah teacher. Our Constitution is based on Torah. What's Torah, Pastor Hill? It's the first five books of this Bible. This holy Bible that every house in America has two, sometimes three. It's based on the first five books. These rules in here were codified as law by the original founders of this country. It was set up so that we could not fail. A nation that follows God will not fail. A nation that rejects God cannot win. God is no respecter of persons. If the other nations followed Torah as their economic model, they would be successful and prosperous. And there was a time in this country when our success and prosperity was a model for other countries to follow. And they came here and asked, how do you have such a great system? And we told them, you follow this book. You can't go wrong. It's a recipe for all success. We don't teach it anymore. The progressives have taken God out of our schools. They've taken God out of our public square. Most of you think that godlessness is the way to happiness because that's what they're teaching you. The central motto or thesis of communism is this. From each according to his means to each according to his needs. That is, they're going to go to people who have and they're going to take what they have and give it to somebody who doesn't have. And we say, oh, that sounds nice. No, it's called theft. It's breaking toil. You're not to steal somebody else's stuff. Right now. Now, they're not going to do this as individuals, though they did in Venezuela. They're going to do this as a, quote, society. So when the society takes the wealth of the wealthy, it's theft. And now everybody in the country is responsible to pay. And as we're going to talk to you from Torah, the thief has to pay back double. So once you start this type of economic theft in a country, there is no end to the poverty and deprivation that's going to follow. Because I don't care who you are or what you believe, God Almighty, the King of the universe, the God of heaven is not mocked. If you steal, you are going to pay back double and you can't stop it from happening. Nor can any government. You cannot build prosperity by stealing from somebody else. Once this kind of stealing starts, the entire country is, is responsible. Exodus chapter 22 in the Torah. And not only the Torah, but a specific section of Torah that is marked the book of the law. There are several sections of Torah. And uh, this is the original book of the law. It talks about the law was added to because of transgressions. Many, many of the other rules in here came because they wouldn't obey the rules that were given in Exodus. So the book of the law is only four chapters. That's all the rules God gave us to live by. But we were such knuckleheads, we wouldn't, we wouldn't listen to God. We couldn't do it his way. So then he had to keep adding rules. Why? Because we kept disobeying. So he had a rule here to stop this disobedience. He had a rule there to stop that disobedience. All we've got to do is obey. The rules can be real simple, amen? Yes. Exodus chapter 22, verse 1. This whole section is marked in the NIV, protection of property. God is very zealous to protect each other's property. When you are able to build, earn, grow, develop something, God wants you to be able to keep the fruit of your hard work. It doesn't belong to somebody else. It belongs to you because you did it, you made it, you grew it. <clears throat> if a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four for a sheep for the sheep. You take a cow, you've got to pay back five cows. You take a sheep, you've got to pay back four sheep. So some theft requires much more restitution than just paying back double. If a thief is caught breaking in and instructs that he dies, the defender's not guilty of bloodshed. So somebody breaks in your house in the middle of the night and you kill them because you can't see. It's dark and you fired a gun. You kill somebody defending your wife and your property and your, your life. Then God says you're guiltless. It's pretty good for me, right? God says you're guiltless. Now you may go to jail, but 
God says you're guiltless. So when you stand before the ultimate judge, guess what? <clears throat> but if it happens after sunset, sunrise, he's guilty of much. In other words, if you can see the intruder, and the intruder sees you draw a weapon and you kill him anyway, without letting them run away, you know, then you're guilty. But if you kill them in the dark, because you can't tell, they can't, they're not running, and you've got to defend yourself, God says you're okay. But it's the theft. If society is the thief, then the whole country has to pay back. The whole country has to pay back. Think about all the wealth that's been confiscated in communist China, communist Russia, Venezuela, all of Cuba, all these communist countries. Do you realize that the Eastern European countries that were under Soviet domination and 50 years of communism still have not recovered economically? Because the theft hasn't been made restitution yet. They can't come out of the poverty until it's done. And then you have a country like Zimbabwe who went communist as soon as they got rid of British rule. And now uh, South Africa's communist. And Kenya's trying to go communist. All these countries are going communist. And they're stealing the wealth. And what happens is now the whole country owes the bill. And it tells us pay. Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. Very simple verse. You shall not steal. You shall not steal. The Hebrew word is ganav. Gimel, noon, bet. Steal, theft, kidnap, deceive. All these go in common, right? They all go together. This is the whole communist philosophy. Take from those who have and give to those who do not. Without regard as to why they don't have. But there's a legitimate reason they don't have. Amen? There's a reason why some people we don't want to help financially, right? Because we know they're not doing the right things with the help they get. Why give them any more, right? I mean, it's been going on from the, the beginning of time. Capitalism is based on honesty, truth, and the Ten Commandments. Do you realize that? We all go out and do business. You don't get paid right away when you do business. You get paid at the end of the month. So you've got to do business. You're selling goods. You're putting it on account. You're expecting them to be honest and fulfill their covenant and pay you at the end of the month, right? Yeah, it's based on honesty. It's based on a forthright. I'm going to do A, and you're going to pay me B. And so I do A, and then you pay me B. Somebody comes to cut your grass, you don't pay him before he fires the lawnmower. You pay him when he loads it back on the truck, right? <clears throat> honesty. We're expecting them to be honest. He's expecting us to be honest. It's based on the Ten Commandments. Communism is built on the ganah, the lying, the stealing, the kidnapping, the deception. Exodus chapter 22. <clears throat> we'll go a little further. Read <clears throat> in verse 4. If the stolen animal is found alive in his possession, whether ox, donkey, or sheep, he must pay back double. If a man grazes his livestock in a field or vineyard and lets them stray and they graze in another man's field, he must make restitution for the best of his own field. You've got to make somebody else whole if you cause destruction of their property. Even if your animals break out and tear up another man's stuff, you've got to go to your field and make restitution of the best of your own to make them whole. <clears throat> If a fire breaks out and spreads into thorn bushes so that it burns shocks of grain or standing grain of the whole field, the one who started the fire must make restitution. If a man gives his neighbor silver or goods for safekeeping and they're stolen from the neighbor's house, the thief, is his, if he's caught, must pay back double. But if the thief is not found, the owner of the house must appear before the judges to determine whether he has laid hands on the other man's property. In all cases of illegal possession of an ox, a donkey, a sheep, a garment, or any other lost property about which someone says, this is fine, both parties are to bring their cases before the, the judges. That is the priest who were in office to judge the case. The one whom the judges declared guilty must pay back double to his neighbor. Just imagine a whole country confiscating the wealth. And the whole country now is due. If a man gives a donkey, an ox, or sheep, or any other animal to his neighbor for safekeeping, and he dies or is injured or is taken away while no one's looking, the issue between them will be settled by the taking of an oath before the Lord that the neighbor did not lay hands on the other person's property. The owner is to accept this, and no restitution is required. But if the animal was stolen from the neighbor, he must make restitution to the owner. If it was torn to pieces by a wild animal, he shall bring in the remains as evidence, and he will not be required to pay for the torn animal. If a man borrows an animal from his neighbor and it is injured or dies while the owner is not present, he must make restitution. 
But if the owner is with the animal, the borrower will not have to pay. The animal was hired, the money paid for the hire covers the loss. People will only work hard if they can keep what they earn. Why is anybody going to work hard? You know, when, when this country was founded in Jamestown, it almost died. Because they had adopted a communist model. We're all going to work the fields and we're all going to share the food. Well, guess who does the work when everybody is supposed to do it? Nobody. When it's everybody's job, nobody does it. Mm -hmm. little cartoon characters in a little place in the sun to come it's nobody and everybody and mm -hmm. Not Not <clears throat> when it's everybody's job nobody mm -hmm. does it so they all start to death because once the first person is too lazy to go work the rest of them are not going to go work to feed the lazy this is built into your human nature so as soon as everybody quits working guess what there's no food and you starve to death so in a communist system, when it's everybody's job to provide, then nobody goes to work. The next year, they changed the system. And they gave everybody a plot of land. And they protected it. You can't take what she grows. And she can't take what he grows. And everybody had to eat off that little square of ground they be amazed how industrious they got there, honey. They was out there working. That's stuff. They had plenty of food. They had time to spare the next year. Why? Because when it was up to you to provide for yourself, you got busy and went to work. Basic human nature, one on one. You're never going to beat it. That's why God imposes capitalism as the economic system for success. So what does the devil come in to do? Well, you're too successful. You're the blessed, most prosperous, successful nation on earth. We're going to introduce some communism and take you down a notch. Young people don't believe that noise. Don't believe that noise. This country was built by great people doing great things. And you can follow in our footsteps if you'll just wake up and come on with it. Capitalism says you can build on the house, on the house you want on your own property. Communism, you're not allowed to build your own house. The government gives you a house. Now, they put this in nice language. You were listening to a great message by Casey Perry on the Via Hopta. And she was talking about at one point the fruit in the Garden of Eden. And she said it was pleasing to the eye. It was desirable. Those are good things, right? We all like something that's pleasing to our eyes and something that sounds desirable. But 13 verses prior, God said, don't do that or you will die. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. All right? So here we are in a system where you can build your own house. In communism... They, they, they put this in nice language so that you get tricked. So don't believe the deception and the lie. They say you have a right to housing in communism. It's just not worth living in. Yeah, so you have a right to a house, and they're going to give you one, but the roof leaks, the carpet's all shot, the plumbing doesn't work, and, it's, and nobody picks up the trash. Is that worth living in? On the other hand, in capitalism, you can go to a nice piece of ground, you can build yourself a nice home, <coughs> For the people who don't want to work hard, they can build a smaller home. For the ones that don't mind working hard, they can have a nicer home. For one man, maybe he's more frugal and doesn't really care for the opulence, it can be simple. For one who really wants nice things, he can make it opulent. You see, the whole point is in capitalism, you get to choose what you want. You get to choose what you want. <clears throat> talking to a neighbor about it, he was talking about uh, the, the, the lady he was dating, and the parents built their dream home, his giant house there at the end of their life, and older folks, they got this dream giant house. Well, I don't want that kind of house when I get to be that age. Amen? I don't want to take care of it. Right? But if you do, that's your business. If you do, that's your business. Why shouldn't you have the house you want if you're paying for it? Amen? And if I want a smaller house because I want to spend my time and money doing something else, why not? Got another a friend of mine that it just bought themselves a, a monster truck because they're going to buy a monster trailer to tell them they want to go traveling. Well, that's their money. If they want to have a smaller house and go traveling, that's their Why shouldn't they have what they want with their money? This is a basic premise in America. This is not a basic premise in most of the world. You're not allowed to have money. Oh, y'all might get this. In, in Cuba, you're guaranteed a wage of $20 a month. You're guaranteed a wage. Everybody gets 
the same way. So Mark Zuckerberg came out just a couple weeks ago and said the same thing. Everybody should be guaranteed a wage. And I'm thinking, what kind of nonsense, communist nonsense is that? You're going to guarantee everybody a wage and won't be worth living on after they inflate the money away. And he, all he wants is you to keep at buying stuff that's advertised on Facebook so he can stay that mega, mega. I mean, those guys are so rich they make the robber barons look like a bunch of pipers, man. This is crazy what's going on right now. And yet he wants to give us a guaranteed wage that they're going to inflate away to nothing. Rather than we get to work and keep our own money, this is nonsense. In Cuba, you're guaranteed twenty dollars a day. All right, well, we just uh, uh, released, a, you know, got back into relations with Cuba, but Canada's been doing this for a long time. So Canada has what I would consider liberal social policies, and I don't mean that in the bad sense of the term. I mean that in the good sense of the term. So Canada's been building hotels in Cuba for thirty years, and they said we want the Canadian, the workers of our Canadian companies, to make the same money they make in Canada. And so Fidel Castro said we love that. Pay them the same thing. That's great. So, okay, Canadian companies pay them $10, 15 an hour like they do in Toronto, and the people still get their $20 a month wage, and the, Canadian, and the Cuban government pockets a spread. See, that's how communism works. Everybody's guaranteed nothing. And so that's all you can have is nothing. You're not allowed to have any more than nothing. If you gave the, the Cubans one egg a day more than they're getting right now, you would double their protein intake. This is a rich country. That's a terrible country. They treat your people awful. Do we want to be like them? No, we want to be like us. Nobody has our kind of wealth. You build a house on your property, it's yours. You want a bigger, better, more art built house? What's it to anybody else? I spend my money on my home. It's my money. You know, some of my neighbors look at me like I'm either rich or stealing, but you know what? They drink, smoke, and spend their money on all kind of other stuff. I spend my money on improvements. What's it to them? It's my money, right? Amen? I, mean, I don't see them walking around white light and cleaning service taking my trash out for me or anything. I mean, I have to earn the money myself. So if I want to spend it on a nicer home, what's it to anybody else? And if I can save and be frugal like my good friend back there taught me how to do, and I can build a little something in my life, what's it to anybody else that I have? It? Amen? If I'm not taking it from anybody else and I'm earning it, what's it? You know, I know a lot of folks that make more money than me, but they go to the convenience store and they give it to them. Mm -hmm. that, okay, that's no skin off my nose. If they want to take their money and spend it at the convenience store, uh, overpaying for things, I'm okay with that. That's their money. Just don't turn around and come back to me and say I was greedy. Because I wasn't greedy. You blew your money because you didn't think about it. When you spent it, I did think about it. I went without all the little things that you bought, and I put it into floors. Light fixtures, plumbing fixtures, cabinetry, and I'm going to have a value for it. So everybody gets to learn the hard way. But you see, we don't want the consequence anymore in America. If we blow our money and spend it on something that's nonsensical, and then later we don't have any money, and the stuff we bought is trash, then we want to blame somebody else. It's their fault we don't have any money. And so the communists use that. They take the people who did not act frugally, and rather than take the correction of my lack of frugality and change my behavior to be more frugal and be more saving and be more industrious, then they take the class envy. Mm -hmm. Well, they stole it from you. No, they didn't. They earned it. They stole it from you. No, they didn't. They earned it. So then you want to go and take their stuff because it's, quote, taking your stuff back. I work for some pretty rich people. They work a lot longer hours than I do. They put in a lot more time to get the degrees, to get the money that they earn. Some of them are still paying back student loans, by the way. So I mean, it's not much like free money coming. They work hard. They save their money. They don't blow their money. That's why they have money. Then they take the money they do get and they invest it in something else that's going to generate more money. Now, I was watching a TV show. Barack Obama, former president, come out and he said, well, how much money can you have? What, what drives these people to, to be so greedy to just keep earning more, 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 more money? Once you get over a billion dollars, what else is there? And Carl Icahn, one of the richest men in America, was being interviewed on CNBC, and he was asked that question. And this was his answer. He said, it's true, I have a lot of money. And if I walk away from my business right now, I will never be able to spend my money at my level of spending nor will my children or maybe even my children's children. He goes, but if I walk away right now, there are going to be thousands of people out of work who have good jobs. So I don't stay in business so I can make more money because I have more money than I'll ever spend. I stay in business and I buy trouble businesses and turn them around 
so that I can provide good paying jobs for thousands and thousands of people so they can have an access and a chance at the wealth I have. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that all capitalists are altruistic, because they're not. But I'm going to tell you this. God uses that innate desire in us to build, grow, produce, be important in the capitalist system to provide jobs for all of us who don't have that opportunity so we can go to work and earn a paycheck and pay our bills. Amen? How many of you work for a boss that's poor? I'll tell you, none of you. I'll tell you, none of you. Every one of your bosses has capital. That's why he has a business, and that's why you have a job. And if you take that capital from him, you're going to be unemployed instantly. Done. Out of job. Out of work. And if you do that to enough business people, then no one's going to have a job, and no one's going to be producing any food, and no one's going to keep the lights on, and no one's going to have the water running out of your tap. So we don't, we don't understand all these things. We don't understand how it's produced. Somebody had to purchase some land at great cost. Somebody had to Work that ground by investing lots and lots of money in tractors and equipment and fuel and seed and fertilizer to see all these fields of soybeans and corn and cotton that you see all around here. That wasn't cheap. It is prohibitively expensive to do that. I ran into a farmer a couple weeks ago. We were buying some stuff at Kohl's, and the man told me he was a farmer. And I told him, you know what? That was my dream as a young man to be a farmer. I said, but it took too much capital. I could not raise the kind of money required for me to have even a five-acre truck farm. I said, God bless you. I hope you keep your farm, and I hope you always make a lot of money. He said, it does take a lot of capital. It's a lot of money invested in that field, whether it produces or it doesn't. You never think about that. All right, but hey, that food in the field... It's not a Kroger. Right? The food in the field is still not where you can take it home. Somebody's got to go out there and harvest that. Then that's got to go to a bin and be dried or whatever they do to it. Then it's got to go to a distributor. Then it's got to be purchased by a grocery store. Then it's got to go through their distribution truck. A lot of truck driving in this. There's a lot of fuel, diesel fuel, driving us around from place to place before it gets to your Kroger. Then your Kroger has to pay all of those employees and all the uptake and all the rent and all the utilities to have that wonderful, beautiful store for you to go in and buy. And it's going to pay for all the loss. So you look at an apple for a buck and a half and you're like, oh, that's crazy. But you don't realize how much cost goes into that buck and a half apple. You don't realize what went into producing that buck and a half apple. And so we're like, we, we, we're completely divorced from the idea of cost. And we just have an idea of what we should be able to get it for. We're almost as full as the millennium. It takes a lot to produce all of what we have. We need to value it. We need to be grateful for this country. We need to be grateful for the things that we have here because other people don't. We do. I do a lot of missions. And I'll tell you right now, I'm, I would be ashamed to take photographs of my Kroger down by my house and send them overseas because they would not understand why we don't help them more with groceries when they're starving in famine. I went and sat over where the little chairs are. You know where they are in my Kroger. And I took a picture of that produce section. Just think about what they would say to us when we only send them 50 bucks a month for food aid and they're in the middle of the worst famine in a century. And I ask everybody just to give 10% of the grocery bill. We don't realize how good we have it. We don't realize how truly great our lives are. We don't realize we walk away from good jobs because we're not happy about it. Yet people overseas can't even get a job can't even get it for them. Tell you what, the whole church in Kenya would come over here and take all our jobs in the heartbeat. They, they, you wouldn't be hearing them complain the way we bless. They'd be happy to have our jobs and our life and our houses. They'd do whatever was required. You see, the boat people washing up on the Spanish shores, don't you, right? Just, just get me across the channel over there to Spain. They come running out of the water. They don't stop for the people filming them with their phones. They go running up in there. I'm going to get up in Spain. I'm going to try to blend into society as quick as I can. I, I, I want to get in a part of this because they have it good over there. We starved to death on the other side. Exodus 23, verse 3. Do not show favoritism to a poor man in his lawsuit. Verse 6. Do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. So whether they're poor or they're wealthy, all people are presumed innocent until proven guilty. And you don't show favoritism. 
So you don't decide that the poor man is a thief until you know for sure. You don't decide the rich man is a thief until you know for sure. But everybody has to be judged on the evidence. Wealth is not proof of theft. It is likely proof of hard work, industry, and frugality. Maybe even a little skill investing. Why aren't we all trying to learn those skills? Why aren't we all trying to learn how to work hard, save our money, be frugal, get a good buy, and invest the money? Where does the envy come in? There was a time in this country where we all aspired to be rich. I remember when Doug and I were back in the rest area days. We used to talk about it all the time. We're going to invest our way to wealth, man. We're going to do all the things we're going to do. And we were somewhat successful in that work we wrote. We were somewhat successful. I think we both had ideas of being a little more successful at it, but I think we did well, as it all turned out. I, I do uh, come running to Morgan once in a while, and, and well, I think we're doing pretty good, actually. Why do we hate rich people? Why do we hate rich people? They're, they're the ones that provide us our jobs. They're our clients. Who do you think is going to hire you? In every country where class envy takes over and they kill the rich and they divide the wealth, the poor in the country never get any of it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They took the czar of Russia and his family, took them out in the woods and shot them. Did the poor Russians get anything out of all that? Of course not. When they took over Venezuela 20 years ago and they and they expropriated all the wealth and took all the big farms, legacy farms, legacy farms that go back to the Antichrist Charles V. And did the poor get any of that? Well, they're squatting on the land, but they're not producing it. They're squatting on the land like a bunch of homeless people. They're living in pieces of tin shoveled together with all their garbage all piled around the house. They're not product producing at those farms anymore. Venezuela used to export food all over the world. Rhodesia used to export food all over the world. And as these communists take over these countries, they turn them into basket cases. You realize the biggest cholera epide epidemic in the world is in Zimbabwe, which used to be Rhodesia? So how to run a country. The communists can't do it. Look, I don't know if y'all watched all this. I don't remember the name of the movie anymore, but there was a movie in uh, Obama's first term where they interviewed the president's half-brother in Kenya. And he points out that in the 1960s, the gross domestic product of Kenya and the gross domestic product of South Korea were essentially the same when Kenya was freed from British rule. They started out the same place. Now Korea has a gross domestic product that's like 30 times that of Kenya, and Kenya's is barely budged from the time they received independence. Why? I'll tell you why. Communism. South Koreans chose capitalism, and they bloomed. If the Kenyans had chosen capitalism, they'd be the jewel of Africa right now. It's not the people. It's the system. Those people can't survive in that system. Believe me, I do missions. I talk to them all the time. They can't survive. If anybody gets anything, someone steals it from them. The guy I deal with has been broken into twice already. Steal all this stuff. It's communism. They had a capitalist system where they could actually keep the benefits of what they produced. That country would be booming right now. Boom. Absolutely booming. We'll go to Proverbs chapter 1. I'm going to show you what communism is like. The poor never get the dividing of the spoils. <clears throat> so young people, don't, don't be deceived to think that if they take over the rich and they kill them all and take all their stuff, you're going to see a penny of it because you're not. <clears throat> you're just going to lose your job and you're going to be unemployed. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let us lie and wait for someone's blood. Let's waylay some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. We'll get all sorts of valuable things that will fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot with us and we'll share a common purse. That's communism, right? A common purse. <clears throat> My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths. For their feet brush into sin and they're swift to shed blood. How useless to spread a net in full view of all the birds. <clears throat> These men lie and wait for their own blood. They waylay only themselves. Such is the end of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the lives of those who get it. So when a country goes communism, and they kill all the wealthy people, which is what they do, and they expropriate all their wealth, and the leaders of the cabal, the communist cabal, take that wealth, and the poor people get nothing, except you lose your job, you're unemployed, now you get your guaranteed wage that's not fit to live on, and you get your guaranteed house that's not habitable, And you got new overlords. 
Except instead of it being capitalism and you work and you get paid, now you just work and they give you what they want you to have. It doesn't work that way. It's never worked that way. It can't work that way. They did this in Venezuela in your sight when the people are starving there now. Venezuela was a prosperous first world country like ours. And in 20 years it is absolutely ruined. Don't let this happen to ours. Go to work. Save your money. Learn how to invest. It's how your grandparents got rich. You know, many of you younger people in your 30s and 20s have, have children. And you get the earned income tax credit every year. Don't treat it like Christmas. It's not a second Christmas. Don't blow the money. You get the earned income tax credit. This is your chance to get out of poverty. Save the money and invest the money and you'll get out of poverty. Maybe you want to purchase that first starter home and you can save two years of EIC and there's your down payment and now you get a start in this world and you go from paying high rent to low payments and you can start building wealth. Use the capital that's being given to you from the taxpayers to get out of poverty. Don't blow the money. You'd be amazed how many people blow this money in a weekend. Well, Lisa and I didn't. When we were poor, we saved our earned income credit. That's how we got out of poverty. Put your hand up, not a hand out. Take it and use it for what it is. Leviticus chapter 25. God really, really is zealous to protect everybody's property. It's really important to him. There's a whole chapter on this. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, just pieces of it. Let's we'll start at verse 8. The year of Jubilee. Count off seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbaths of years amount to a period of 49 years. Then you will have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. Sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the fiftieth year. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to all its inhabitants. And it will be a jubilee. Each one of you is to return to his family property and each to his own clan. So every 50 years, no matter what happens to the land, everybody returns to their ancestral homeland. God divided the land up in the entire nation of Israel by family, and every family was capitalized. That was your capital. God capitalized everybody. So if you're a farmer, you've got land, there it is, farm it. Produce from the ground, sell what you, what you grow, and you will have wealth. If you like to make things, there's your property. Build you a workshop, make what you want to make, and go sell it. If you're a trader, put your big warehouse up, buy goods and sell goods. There's your property. You don't have to go get a location down on Main Street. God gave you a property for which to do. If, if, no matter what trade it is, if you're a hairdresser or a barber or it doesn't matter what it is, a doctor. If you're a preacher, put a church up. You're good to go. You've got your property. Everybody was capitalized. And if you got into misfortune because you couldn't handle your money, and it happens, maybe one generation is great at handling money, the next can't do it. Then you sell your property, it can only be sold to the next Jubilee, because every 50 years God reset the capital. Every 50 years He reset the capital. One generation couldn't hamstring the next. So no matter how bad anybody got, but let me tell you something else, this also kept rulers from taking your property, because no matter what happened, every 50 years you've got to go back to your ancestral homeland. This doesn't allow for communist ownership of the land. God gave the land to people. The land has to be divided up by families. Well, it's good for Israel. It's good for the whole world, right? The entire earth has to be surveyed and divided up by family so that everybody gets a plot of land and no one can take it from you. I have a problem with our brothers in Kenya because they changed the Constitution. Barack Obama's cousin gave him a communist Constitution, and so if he can't produce off of his land, he can't keep it. So I asked uh, Dr. Niberi about that several years ago, and he said, Brother, this is their ancestral homeland. They've had it since the beginning of time. They don't want to lose it. Why should it even be up for loss? If this is their ancestral homelands going back to the beginning of time, who is the government to come in and take it from them and give it to something? That's death. That's death. That's death. You can't come and take somebody's land. But you see, when the government does it, everybody's responsible to make restitution for it. Because it's society. See, now everybody has to pay. You can't get poverty like that off, off a nation. Deuteronomy 15. The land also doesn't belong to just people in general. It doesn't belong to Mother Earth. You know, our people worship Mother Earth. 
I know it sounds strange to those of us out there, but there's young people not worship Mother Earth. The land doesn't belong to Mother Earth. God says the land belongs to the human beings and livers to be divided up by family. You can keep your ancestral home life forever. Forever. Perpetuity. It, 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 did it say that Pele was named Pele because the world was divided in his time? The world's already been surveyed and divided up by Shem. We're all supposed to be where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to have our own inheritance. We're supposed to make it happen on our inheritance. Amen? Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 1. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it's to be done. Every creditor should cancel the loan he's made to his fellow Israelite. He shall not require payment from his Israelite fellow Israelite or brother because the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. So every seven years, the debts are gone. That's why the original bankruptcy code of the United States lets you bankrupt debts every seven years. Because God didn't want you to have debts forever. See, the Founding Fathers had such a thing in the English colonies as debtor prison. Now, that's an oxymoron for you, isn't it? You owe somebody money you can't pay, so they put you in prison. How are you going to pay for a prison? You can't. So they put you in prison in perpetuity for a debt. They said, we're not going to do that anymore. So they put a bankruptcy code in place where you get it over your head, you've got to clean up every seven years, you can wipe it off. Now, for some reason, we had a knucklehead in Congress that decided that 10 years was better than 7. But I just want you to understand that the Founding Fathers were Bible readers, and that's why it was 7 in the beginning. You know bankruptcy is a constitutional right. You realize that, right? See, a lot of y'all don't understand the Constitution. You don't know what's a right and what's not a right. Bankruptcy is a constitutional right. It's in the Constitution that you can bankrupt. Well, come on, guys. One million dollars got three heads. This is real stuff. <laughs> Now, I want to talk about this. We're not a society. We're 325 million individuals. If you want to talk about society, they're fixing to rob you or somebody else in your name. We're not a society. You hear these politicians, well, we're, we're America's a rich society. We can afford it. We're not a society. We're 325 million individuals. And if those people who want to pay for something, they need to reach in their own pocket and pay for it. Get out of mind. Amen. <laughs> They really want to pay for that. Quit talking about my money and start using their money. You know, and I'm going to call names. Bernie Sanders needs to pay for it himself. I don't want to pay for what Bernie Sanders wants to do. This might be a rich country, but if it's so rich, then he can pay for it. We're not a society. We're 325 million individuals. And for this country to do anything, it means that most of us have to pony up cash to do it. Now, you know how they throw away the cash we send them now, right? Do you really think sending them more cash is going to make it better? They can't spend the money we send them now. What makes you think they're going to spend this money any better? I'll tell you what they're going to do. They're going to give political patronage to their friends, and they're going to spend the money on their friends who are going to contribute to their campaigns. Mm -hmm. So they're taking your tax money, and it's a roundabout loop to put more money in their campaigns. That's why they can stay in office forever and ever and ever, and no one can ever bump them out. It's crazy. So don't vote for more taxes, vote for less taxes. Kill the beast. Quit feeding it. There's a reason for that. We're 325 million individuals seeking a better life. The power of 325 million individuals seeking a better life, able to keep the money that we earn, able to tend to our families the way we see fit, and able to progress our lives by saving and investing and building and passing it to our children, that is how you have an unstoppable nation that can never be. That's how you make America great. It's got to be one individual at a time. And the first thing you've got to do is get back in the Bible. Because if you don't straighten your life up in the Bible, none of this can happen for you. Now, capitalism is seeking that better life through hard work, thrift, and investing. This is the greatest time in the history of mankind to be alive in the United States to work hard, save your money, and invest. There's never been a better one. People say times are bad, this and this and this and it. Look around you. This is the best time there has ever been. If it's so bad, why do you think people are beating the doors down to get in this place? I don't see a mass exodus from America to somewhere else. I see a mass exodus of people trying to get in here because it's so good. Now, communism and crime both seek that better life from killing and stealing. Criminals do it by themselves. They see you, you got money, boom, I'll take your money. Communists do it as a society, as a whole, and they make the whole society guilty. 
All of the communists are involved in drugs. You dig a little, you're going to find this out. Uh, I forget which of the, the, the goofy liberal channels just put this whole thing on here about the CIA selling drugs. It wasn't the CIA selling drugs. Don't believe those lies. The drug cartels are involved with the communists. Most of the drugs in this country are, are handled and controlled through Cuba and Nicaragua and Venezuela and uh, Bolivia. Those are your main communist countries right now that are handling the drug trade. They want to undermine your faith in your own country. So they tell you lies to get you to believe what they want to tell you so that you won't think this is worth keeping. I'm telling you it's worth keeping. It's the only thing on planet Earth right now that is worth keeping as far as governments of men. The communists control the drug trade. Look, they just made a peace treaty in Colombia with the communist rebels down there. Do you realize that those communist rebels control all the cocaine coming out of Colombia? And have from the get-go. So don't support your enemies. Quit buying drugs. Right? When you buy drugs, you're buying from your enemies. They want to kill you and take your stuff, and you're giving them the money to buy the guns. Incidentally, that's the whole fallacy of gun control laws because the criminals don't go to the gun store to get guns. They don't go to gun shows to get guns. Criminals buy the guns from the drug dealers. And the criminal cartels, they're not buying illegal guns. They're buying illegal guns. Y'all get that a lot. The only way to solve the drug problem in these United States is for us to quit buying. That's just simple. No buyers, no sellers. If everybody decided, you know what? I don't need drugs. How about some 401k money? That'd get you high. Huh? <laughs> oh, come on now. When you get that bank statement, there's extra money in there because your stuff went up. You know you get happy. You get real happy. And it, it lasts a little longer than 30 minutes, and you're still happy tomorrow. Come on. I mean, that makes everybody feel good is to have a little wealth in the pocket. Come on. It works. Trust me. Just quit doing drugs. And the sellers are going to take over your country and enslave the whole population. Why buy from them? Genesis chapter 11. This goes back a long way, guys. It's the same old lies. The devil runs the same place. He's been telling these lies from the get-go, and he's not about to quit. Genesis 11, verse 1. There's a whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. And they said to each other, Come and let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. <clears throat> and they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And then they said, Come and let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Now, I'm not going to go through all the verses, but Nimrod was the one who did this. Yeah. Nimrod was the one who coerced the people to build the Tower of Babel because they wanted a great name for themselves. But I want you to notice how he went to bricks. Not stone. Bricks. Stones are unique. In that sense, we are like stones because we're all unique. Bricks are all uniform. They're all made exactly in the same mold. And they're all made to be that way. And so for Nimrod to bring the people together to make that one society he had to make everybody conform to everything he wanted so that they were like bricks. All identical. All the same. Nameless, faceless, creativeless bricks. Because see, in Nimrod's way of thinking, which is the communist way of thinking, you're just a piece of material to be used by them. In God's system, everybody is free to be creative, to be industrious, because you're a unique individual and a unique creation. That's why God did not create societies. Men create societies to subject you to their power and control. Whereas God gave you freedom under the law of God so that you can be the person that he created you to be. Grow your own wealth, make your own way, have your own stuff, raise your own family. Freedom. That's what I'm going to offer you again. This book, Freedom Under the Law of God, because your freedom is guaranteed in Torah, because the founding fathers of the United States of America were Bible readers. They guaranteed your Torah freedoms in a document called the United States Constitution. And I'm afraid not enough millennials know what's in it or why the things are in it that are in it. I'm telling you, start right here. Order this free, you know, small, small donation. Any book that you buy from Hungry Hearts, it includes sales tax and shipping. So when you see that cost, that's all in 
you uh, go go to PayPal and pay for this. It's a small donation. I think it's like twelve dollars or something like that. And this uh, careful stewardship of God's rich blessing is even less. Avail yourselves of these materials while they're still available and still available online. God made us all unique with differing talents and abilities because he wants us to be unique individuals. When you look at God's creation, everything is unique. Even if you look at oak trees, no two oak trees are identical. They all have differences. They all have their own uniqueness. Every tree has its own circumstance. Every tree has undergone its own stresses and has its own beauty. We call it character in the landscape business, amen. And each of us has had the same thing. We go through different experiences. They, they model us and they shape us into unique individuals that God considers beautiful. Society wants to make us uniform bricks that are all the same for their building of their project, usually to their own wealth and not yours. <clears throat> That's why we prosper under freedom and wither under conformity. God did not make us to be uniform bricks. He made us to be diverse people. When people run this country down, I want you to question their motives. When people tell you this country is the source of the world's problems, I want you to realize they are your enemy. When people tell you that we're a society, don't let them make a brick out of you. When they tell you what this country can afford, question why they want your money and tell them to put their own money on the table first. Amen? Work hard. Save. Invest your money. Build your home. Raise your children. Live by this Holy Hebrew Bible. That is the only way to make America great again. It takes all of us as individuals building our own personal lives, our own selves, to make this country great. Come on, everybody. Let's go to work. Again, I want to offer you our free magazine, Pursuit. It's available quarterly. You can email me at hungryheartsmin at aol.com. Send me your mailing address, and I'll send you the magazine. I want to thank you for watching today. I hope I didn't step on too many toes, but... There's a great deception in life going on in this country right now, and most of you have been taught contrary to the truth. Uh, I want you to search. Get online and Google the Founding Fathers and look up their lives and look up the things that they did and look up what made this country great because we have a country worth fighting for, a country worth defending. So I hope today I've helped you to have a closer walk with Jesus and to get into your Bible, especially the Old Testament, and learn about those great freedoms God put in there. If you're interested in more information, it's available on the web at HungryHeartsMinistry.com. I want to thank you for watching and hope to see you again soon.